Tonight on the docket, the president as king. Tonight, the president began a three-day tour promoting his big government sidestepping of Congress on issues including student loans and housing. Instead of going through Congress to get his measures passed, he's signing off on a series of executive orders to do it his way. This is part of the president's strategy to campaign, to campaign against what he calls a do-nothing Congress. And he's released a new slogan, we can't wait. But if all the president has to offer is to borrow and spend trillions more, then Freedom Watch will respond with the president's old slogan. Yes, we can. Yes, we can wait on his rule that would limit foreclosures on homes backed by federally guaranteed mortgage. Look, I am not cold hearted. Having one's home foreclosed is a terrible thing. But if you can't afford your home, the federal government should not step in to prevent what the free market allows in order to end the housing crisis. Actions have consequences, and keeping people in homes they cannot afford will only make the housing crisis worse. And yes, we can wait on a possible rule to ease repayment of student loans. While student loans bog down many in this country, it's not fair to the taxpayers that they should carry the financial burden for those who enrolled in colleges they couldn't afford. My next guest says this is in any way to run the government under our Constitution. And he's not happy about the president leaving him and other lawmakers out of the equation when it comes to big government efforts with housing and education. Here to discuss, Texas Republican Congressman and Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul. Congressman Paul, it's always a pleasure. Welcome back to Freedom Watch. Thank you, Judge. Should the federal government have anything to do with education in the first place, whether it's micromanaging the local schools or whether it's lending money to uh, people to go to college and grad school? No, the federal government should be out of it completely. There's no authority for it. There's no prohibition in the Constitution to the states, so you can't say that all governments should be out of it, but the federal government has no authority to do it, and they've caused nothing but harm. They've caused prices to go up and the quality of education go down, and they left the students with a uh, trillion dollars worth of debt and no jobs. It's a failed policy, and we ought to recognize it. And, and might the president, if he has his way, Congressman Paul, actually leave taxpayers with that trillion dollar debt? Because under the law, until he signed the new one today, the government backed up the loan. So if the student didn't pay the loan back, they back the bank that loaned the money. The government paid the bank. And now the government has the option of going after the students to the tune of a trillion bucks. If the government says, well, we want these students to vote for us, so we're not going to go after them, that trillion dollars is just added to our national debt. Yeah, it, it is. And, uh, you know, uh, you talk about the taxpayers, but even when the program seemed to have worked, it's a subsidy because that money was taken from somebody else that could have had the credit and given, a, you know, they allocated the credit and they made the wrong, you know, a bad decision. But this uh, is also painful because those individuals suffer. But in many ways, some people who don't get to go to college or don't get to go to medical school or something like that and they get help from from the government, we you mean people who didn't have a good job. Maybe the average working man has to pay for this. It's a very unfair system, and uh, they they created a huge bubble, just like they did in the housing bubble. And this is uh, very difficult to resolve, you know. But they've made these mistakes. It's 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 malinvestment. It's excessive debt. It has to do with the whole concept of government. And now we're trying to unwind it. Then they say we who want to make these suggestions to make these corrections we don't care and we're causing all the trouble well they caused the bubble they caused the crisis and, and all this mischief we're trying to clean it up so we shouldn't be blamed right. for cleaning up the mess they created but that's what they like to do and politically very often they win that argument which is i'm trying to compete with and show them that they're wrong on this argument C coupled with this uh, congressman paul which is the selective forgive forgiveness of government debt will now be the selective delay of foreclosures. Now look, nobody wants people to be thrown out of their homes, but if they can't afford the homes and the loan hasn't been paid back and the bank has the right to the loans under, under principles of contract, under, under, under the law and under principles of morality, who the heck is the federal government to come in and say to the bank, you can't have that house, even though they told you you could take the house if they couldn't pay the loan at the time you lent yeah. them the money? It, it destroys the concept of contracts. The government's supposed to be there to enforce contracts, not to 
undermine the contracts. Well, so we're going to give them a loan even though the value of the house has gone way down. This prolongs the necessary correction, the liquidation, get rid of the male investment and debt. So this is the reason we'll be in the doldrums for a long time as long as we follow this attitude. This is the reason Japan's still in the doldrums. This is the reason the depression lasted so long. So we're still fighting some old-fashioned uh, economic interventionist ideas of Keynes, and we need to compete more vigorously with this to show them that it's their fault, the market works much better, the government has a responsibility, but it's to guarantee contracts and sound money and not guarantee these bubbles and this malinvestment that they create. Switching gears, uh, you've been preaching freedom your uh, entire professional political life. You're preaching it now. You're explaining it so nicely on the show. Your poll numbers never go down. Everybody else's poll numbers amongst the Republican candidates up one day and down the next. You're steady as can be with a slight uptick here and a slight uptick there. How's it going? How do you feel in your gut when you go out and campaign in Iowa, in New Hampshire, in South Carolina, wherever else you go? Each, each day a little bit better. The, uh, just the other day, we were at the University of Iowa, and we had 1,200 young people come out, and they were very, very enthusiastic. So I proposed a law. You know, I'm not for many laws, but, Judge, I think we ought to have only those people under 30 get to vote, and I think I would win the election very easily. But, no, but in a way, though, this is very encouraging. You know that the young people respond to what we've been talking about. I say we're on to something because it's the young people that's inheriting this mess, and they know that it's not working. They know we need... They need new ideas. So that to me is encouraging. The big challenge I have is between now and January to make sure we have a very good showing. And I would say that things are so different from four years ago. The enthusiasm, the money raising, the number of volunteers, the organization, our t TV is so much better. So I'm quite uh, enthusiastic about where we are right now. Congressman Paul, thanks for joining us. We love having you on. Thank you, Judge. Vice President Joe Biden.